All right. Just set my little timer here. How's everyone doing? Monday morning, you feeling good? Good, good. I'm here to talk about a little thing uh, called AI that maybe you've heard about lately. Um, so first of all, before I dive in uh, real quick, I just want to say, give a huge thanks to the GoTo Chicago team for uh, having me speak today. It's truly an honor. And just so we're clear about this, the only reason they had me do this is because ChatGPT couldn't make it today. Um, so we're going to talk about large language models, friend, foe, or otherwise. So first question for you all by a show of hands, how many of you are excited about AI? Awesome. Most of you. How many of you are concerned about AI? Okay, about an equal number. Good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about AI today. Now, I don't know how much you know, experience you have with AI or not, so I'm going to assume you know, we're going to start from a little bit of scratch in just the definition. So we make sure we're on the same page, we're using the same terminology. So normally when I define artificial intelligence, I start with intelligence like how we think for humans um, and animals and things like that. So roughly speaking, it's sort of all about learning, understanding, and then using that knowledge learned to do things, like carry out tasks. So for humans, we learn when we're a baby, we have sort of a blank slate, and then we start learning from our friends, our parents, our school, we do experimentations, trial and error, and so on, and we start to develop sort of our world model, um, our understanding of the world around us. And then it allows us to do things like have conversations, the tasks that we need to do every day at work, and so on. And so naturally, we can extend that to artificial intelligence simply by saying intelligence exhibited by machines. So if we could get machines to learn things uh, using something called machine learning, which is just a bunch of different kinds of algorithms, or what they call learning algorithms, to learn automatically, usually from data, to learn stuff, we can then create an understanding, which is what we call a model, usually, which consists in the parametric case of machine learning of a lot of parameters. And then that understanding or that model could be used to do things like make predictions, detect spam coming into your email client, detect cancer in an image of a skin lesion, for example, and so on. And then there's different families of these learning algorithms, you know, neural networks, deep learning, and so on. So that's AI. So we've all heard about ChatGPT and large language models, and it's just like literally taking the world by storm at the moment, which is quite remarkable. So I just the other day went on um, Google Trends, and I, I went back a year and a half, so January 1st, 2022, to see, okay, I'm going to take very common search terms, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I mean, these are top level, very you know, significant search terms. And I'm going to compare them to ChatGPT over this time. Now, clearly, you could see there's no ChatGPT because it hadn't really been introduced until late, uh, late 2021. However, as soon as it's on the scene, it just exponentially blows up in comparison to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this is a relative scale how Google Trends works. But you can see, like, at its peak recently, it was 10 times more searched for than artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is really remarkable. So what that means is the cat is really out of the bag, and it's just not going back in. And not only that, there's never been a time in uh, history where technological advancements have been reversed. And in fact, you can't uninvent things. Things can only become obsolete. So we're really at a remarkable, pivotal time at the moment, right, where uh, not only is the public awareness of AI and especially large langu language models at its like absolute peak and max, but people are seeing what they could do, and a lot of these things are quite remarkable. But along with that also comes uh, some amount of concern for people, like we saw at the beginning here. Um, one of which is things like, you know, will AI take my job or have some sort of significant impact on my job? Which is a good question. How many of you have ever heard of Pedro Domingos? Okay, a few. He wrote a book called, he's a professor, and he also wrote a book called The Master Algorithm, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it. Um, but he, he did a tweet recently that's pretty funny. He says, it's too late, we have unleashed AGI upon humanity. Anxiety generating innovation, that is. Which is kind of funny and sort of apropos, right? And you know, clearly there's a lot of concern and a lot of hype and you know, all this sort of thing going on out there. Now, one other thing that's worth mentioning is that automation and the idea of augmenting tasks that humans do with, with something that makes it easier, better, more efficient, whatever the case may be, 
is not new, right? Even since the invention of tools, that's been going on, and then exponentially going on since the Industrial Revolution. And then, of course, even in the software development space, even without AI, you have this whole movement of low code, no code, and so on, which is also a form of abstracting away those technical difficulties of coding and software architecture and all this sort of other stuff. And honestly, at this point, it's quite, uh, for those of you that try and keep up with this stuff, it's actually really challenging. It's, it, you know, things are getting quite dizzying and a little bit blurry. Um, AI is advancing literally daily, every day. And some of this stuff is really hard to predict where it's going. On top of all that, the leading experts in the world, globally, around AI, don't even agree on things. They don't agree on like, okay, when and if will we see things like AGI? Uh, is there really a threat? And if so, what's the level of that threat? What will happen with regulation? Should we have regulations? Should we not? And if we do have regulations, what should they look like? And also, what will the impact be on jobs and society and so on? And then even the lines blurring a little bit between what used to be more traditional sort of software developer or software engineer and like an AI researcher or machine learning engineer. Now it's kind of like a little bit blended across the thing. And if you don't prioritize keeping up, whether it's an organization or an individual, sometimes there could be sort of not great consequences. So here's an example of that. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Kodak? <laughs> So at one point in time, Kodak was like literally probably the most famous brand maybe on planet Earth, literally. Um, but they just didn't understand the significance of digital photography and digital cameras and where things were going. And they just didn't want to adapt really all that well, or even if they did, they didn't do it quick enough and so on. And so they just don't exist anymore. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond recently announced that they were going bankrupt, they're closing all their stores, and they cited that the reason they're doing that and what happened was they just didn't appreciate the advancement of e-commerce and the importance of e-commerce and so on, and so they just didn't keep up with that. Same with Blockbuster, right? Netflix came on the scene, there's this whole new like, hey, we're doing this streaming thing. They're like, yeah, but people really like DVDs and so on and going into a store and we know what happened from there. But rather than look at everything through sort of this negative lens, let's imagine a positive future with AI. What does that world look like? Clearly it looks like Chicago. Um, so going back to Pedro Domingos for a second, another tweet he did literally just you know, a month ago, not even a month ago, he said, people fear what they don't understand, the cure is understanding it, AI is no exception. And I agree entirely. In fact, that's, that's like the vision and mission. A, a big part of the vision and mission of my company, Y of AI, is that we're trying to help people and organizations understand AI and machine learning. Like, what is it? Why does it matter? Who does it matter to? What are the risks? What are the potential considerations? What are the opportunities and different kinds of use cases? And how do you use it in responsible, trustworthy, safe, and fair ways? Things like that. So it's really important to gain that understanding. So let's, let's dive into this a little bit more to make sure you know, we work a little bit on understanding for those of you that aren't. How many of you would consider yourself very familiar with large language models in terms of how they work under the hood? Okay, so, okay, cool. So we're gonna talk about that here today, great. So from capabilities perspective, what can these things do? Well, we're obviously seeing a, a lot of really amazing things every day, right? Well, one great uh, library, if you haven't heard of it, although I'm sure many of you have, is Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a company that claim, or says they're trying to democratize artificial intelligence through open source tools and open science. Um, and they build a library that basically um, wraps these amazing things called transformers, which I'll talk about shortly in terms of how they work and everything. And transformers are sort of the architecture and model type that underlies ChatGPT, GPT-4, and the, thing, the LLMs we're seeing today. And so if you go to their website, you'll see there's a task page. And on the task page, they kind of break, I love how they break things up. Uh, another great site for something like this is Papers with Code, if you haven't been there, uh, especially on their State of the Art tab, where they kind of break down um, different areas of artificial intelligence, so like computer vision, natural language processing, multimodal. 
AI and machine learning, by the way, are huge, massive fields. I know right now everybody's focused so heavily on large language models and chat GPT and stuff, but there's, there's really a lot more to these fields in different areas. But in either case, we're talking about LLMs today. So under these different areas, there's all these different tasks, things like image classification, question answering, summarization, and so on. And then if you go to OpenAI's website, they have an examples tab, and they kind of lay it all out there too, like all these sort of different things you could do with ChatGPT or GPT-4. Um, but like at a high level, we kind of already know to some extent, because we've all played with it or seen things most likely. You know, you can summarize things, you can write emails, you can write marketing copy, you can do coding, which we'll talk about here in a bit. You can retrieve information, you can get questions answered, and things like that, right? So what about coding? Well, you can, right now, you know, these tools could be used to do autocomplete of code, or they can automatically write functions and code snippets. There's applications where you can translate between different kinds of coding languages. Did I miss anything? Anything else that anybody here has used these tools to do for software development or engineering? Just high level? Yep, you're nine. Or somebody want to say something? Yeah. Awesome, yep, used to replace, so the, the comment was used it to replace documentation for tools that have terrible documentation. Yeah, and there's unfortunately no shortage of not the best documentation out there, which is never all that fun. So how did we get here? What's the evolution of this stuff? Okay, well, it all starts with research, AI research in particular, right? AI and machine learning research. And research doesn't just come from academia, from academic institutions. There's a lot of organizations that do research as well. And, and of course, the, the big sort of tech giants and Silicon Valley folks do a lot of research. And usually that research, which advances the field, surfaces itself either in the form of papers, typically, which are published often to archive, uh, which is hosted by Cornell University, um, or at conferences, very large sort of major conferences, right? in the space. So let's take a quick tour of how we got to where we're at today and how all this buzz around LLMs and ChatGPT started. In 2017, a paper was published called Attention is All You Need. This is like arguably one of the most famous papers ever written for AI by far. I highly encourage you to read it if you're interested. But this is the paper that introduced the transformer architecture and models to the world essentially. And it also introduced this concept of attention and these mecha mechanisms for what they call attention called self-attention mechanisms and multi-headed attention mechanisms. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute so you kind of understand what attention means if you don't already. In 2019, a paper comes out by OpenAI called Language Models Are Unsupervised Multitask Learners. This is the GPT-2 paper. This paper is really remarkable because not, you know, attention is all you need is like, oh, hey, we've got these transformers. They do really cool things and they can like summarize stuff and they can, you know, create kind of a lot of what we're seeing today, but although they weren't as advanced yet by any means. But then this next paper comes out for GPT-2 and says, oh, and they're also multitask learners. What that meant is that these models, these large language models, can also do tasks that they were never explicitly trained to do. So when you ask these models to summarize an article or write a list or come up with ideas for you or write an email, there was never a part of the training process for that model where it was trained specifically and explicitly to do those specific tasks. It just knows how to do them on the fly based on the prompt that you put into them. So that's really remarkable. So this is like, hey, these models are kind of incredible. They understand language to some extent and they can do things they were never trained to do. In 2020, another paper, again an open AI paper comes out called Language Models Are Few Shot Learners. This is the GPT-3 paper. This paper goes a step beyond and says, okay, not only can these things do things that they were never trained explicitly to do, but they can also be fine-tuned and conditioned and specialized on the fly at, at use time by just giving some examples. All right, so in the prompt, you can include examples if you want. That's what's called shots. So if you put no examples in your prompt, that's zero shot learning. Um, if you put a few examples, that's few shot learning. But basically, let's say you say, I want to summarize this article, 
and I want the summary to be in the style of these examples. And then you give some examples that sort of are very succinct, they use a certain kind of tone and voice and something like that. The model right there when you hit go essentially sort of learns on the fly to uh, become specialized in writing those summaries like the examples you gave it. So that doesn't have to be at the time the model was originally trained, you could do it right on the fly. That was the big sort of revelation of the GPT-3 paper. But then people started to realize, well, hey, these models, are they really aligned to human values and intents? That's what's called alignment in AI. And so, and are they trustworthy? Can we trust what they're saying? Um, should we be worried about some of this output? Could it be harmful and so on? So what people then did is they started to figure out, okay, well, what kind of techniques can we come up with in the research side of things to make these, to, to solve the alignment problem and make these models more trustworthy, more safe, more aligned to human values and intents and so on. And so this technique came out called reinforcement learning from human feedback, which some of you, how many of you have heard of reinforcement learning from human feedback? Okay, so about half of the crowd. And in this, this model, I'll talk about it a little more in a minute, but in this case, essentially what it did is it used humans in the loop to kind of fine tune these models to be more human-like, to kind of respond in a more human-like fashion, but also to be more safe, more trustworthy, and better aligned to human values and intents. And then OpenAI sort of took that research and they applied it to their GPT models to then create what we now call ChatGPT. Um, and then, who knows, TBD in the future. So how do these things work? Let's talk a bit about it since it sounds like, luckily, a lot of you uh, this may be new to. So um, basically the first thing to realize is that natural language is really hard. It's a really hard problem to solve, actually. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One is in natural language, every word has different, has something called semantic meaning. And that semantic meaning it's kind of complicated to try, I mean, when we think of the meaning of a word, oftentimes we might think of like definitions in a dictionary, right? You Google like, hey, what's the meaning of the word? And you get like the Oxford definition back or something. That, that's true, but words have a much more deeper meaning than, than just that, especially when you want to use them by machines to do things like we see Chad GPT and other LLMs do. So you have to kind of figure out a way to determine the semantic meaning of words using algorithms and those words can have different meanings depending on how they're used in different kinds of ways and, and how they appear in language. Another thing that's really critical with language is context. So words have their own meaning, but they also exist in context. There's usually words either before those words or there's words after those words, like in the case of a sentence, a paragraph, a paper, you name it, right? And so to understand all that meaning, you need to have both that semantic meaning piece figured out and you have to have the context piece figured out. But going a step further, what makes the context problem really tricky as well is that you have all kinds of other issues. You have things called co-references. So there's often words in language that refer to a specific entity or thing, but they're not the same word. Um, so like I could say, hey, we're at the GoTo conference Chicago right now. And then I could say, it was awesome. It, in that case, refers to the conference. So that's a co-reference. We're talking about the same entity, but the different words to say that, right? A lot of times, words can be very ambiguous. And so when you try to disambiguate a word, it's called word disambiguation. That's another issue. There's parts of speech. Some words are nouns, some are adverbs, some are conjugations, some are prepositions. How do you figure all that out? Um, another thing is grammar rules. Right? So there's things like subject verb agreement. So cat pounces versus cats pounce, or uh, possessive nouns like Alex's cat. By the way, I'm a huge cat fan. I have a cat named Yoda. Love cats. Um, <laughs> hence the cat pictures. So as the research progressed, people figured out a way to solve, a good way to solve the semantic meaning part, right, that we just talked about. And the way to do that is when we talk about that semantic meaning, basically you could think of it that each individual natural language word is like a recipe. It's like baking a cake, right? There's a certain amount of flour, there's a certain amount of sugar, whatever it is, it has a recipe. So if we could figure out a way to take a large body of language, which what people call a corpus, a data corpus, 
right? And we train using techniques like self-supervised learning where we don't have to annotate the data. We can kind of automatically learn things about words in their context and so on. So some examples are a continuous bag of words. Another one is called Skipgram. We may be able to figure out what are those underlying recipe ingredients or the semantic meaning of individual words. And we call those things word embeddings. Word embeddings are literally just a vector of numbers. So think of like the word queen as being represented by a vector of numbers. This is an example from a great article called the Illustrated Word to Vec, and where each one of these bars is a number and it's just color coded based on the value of the number. And what these algorithms do is they learn what's called a latent representation of the word or latent features of the word. And each of these latent features, which essentially is just a number, each of those numbers in a vector, represents some latent feature or theme or concept, but it doesn't make sense to us humans. That's why it's called latent, because it's just a number. But it does kind of capture some of those ingredients, like the meaning. And so if we look at different word embeddings for different kinds of words, we can maybe see some similarities between different ones. And one of the examples given is like in the word queen, if we think of the recipe of the word queen or some of those potential latent meanings or features, you know, you could think of things like royalty or lives in a castle or female or things like that. And we could see what, when we overlay the word embeddings in this example of a lot of different words horizontally above each other, you see this one red stripe here that kind of goes vertically through all of them, meaning that that value of that vector, whatever that latent feature is, is pretty similar across all those words. So maybe that's the learned latent concept of like something like humans, right? Because in some ways those are all related to humans. Maybe, we don't know, because we don't know what the, these numbers necessarily represent. But, so that kind of solves the semantic meaning piece. Now what about all that other stuff that I talked about that's pretty difficult? Well, in the case of parts of speech, here's a great example of that. The word work is a noun when it's in the sentence, I went to work, but it's a verb in the sentence, I work in the garden. And you can see other examples there. So here we are, and we get this magical thing called a transformer model that seemingly solves all these problems. It solves the word disambigu disambiguation problem. It, so it solves the co-reference resolution problems, parts of speech problems, grammar rules problems, semantic meaning problems, all that stuff, context, right? So this is the, the transformer architecture that was introduced in that attention is all you need paper. On the left side, this thing is called the decoder. On the right side, you have, er, you have the encoder, sorry. The left side is the encoder, the right side is the decoder. And when you combine them together, you have what's called the encoder decoder or a sequence to sequence model. And these sides can be trained independently of one another which means that they can have different and do have different parameters, okay? So like, just like y equals mx plus b is the equation of a straight line, right? Where you learn through something like linear least squares, the value for m, which is the slope of the line, the value for b, which is the y-intercept, those are the parameters of that model. Once you have the right parameters that, that correctly map the relationship between x and y, then you just put in an x and you get out hopefully the right value of y. Well, in the case of GPT-3, which has 175 billion parameters, the same thing is true. It learned those parameters. In this case, there's just way more of them. But if you put in an X, meaning a prompt, you get out a Y through those parameters that maps it to a summary or code or something like that. And by the way, this is a simplified diagram. These things are actually much more complicated. In the case of GPT-3, there's actually like something like 96 decoder layers that aren't re represented here. We're not zoomed in far enough. So this is like deep learning type stuff, architectures. And in each of those layers, there's like 1.9 billion parameters. But regardless, um, this thing somehow solves a lot of those problems with uh, language being hard. Now the encoder side is really specific and does certain things really well. It, do, it works similarly to that word embeddings thing I talked about where you put something in and it creates latent representations of whatever you put in. So think you get vectors out again like embeddings, but in this case now they have a lot more context in them. They're richer. They don't just contain the semantic meaning like the word embeddings do. Now they contain some sort of understanding of context as well to help solve all those other problems like I mentioned before. 
Now, part of what makes this so interesting is prior to this way of doing it, we had things called recurrent neural networks, or RNNs, and things like long short-term memory. In those cases, people are really struggling to figure out how do, you, how do you get these models to have some concept of memory? So they, you know, as you get a long sequence of words or paragraphs, things like that, how does it remember what happened in the context earlier in the language? Well, that's really not trivial, and so people use the architecture itself to handle that. They create these really like complex architecture, model architectures, to try and deal with like the memory and all these other issues. In this case, this is kind of ingenious. You see this positional encoding thing here. They moved it from the architecture of the model to the data itself. So when you put an input, like a prompt, it converts it to an embedding, then it adds the positional values for each of the words in the prompt. Now it's part of the data that goes into the model, and then you get the output. So that was one of the big things. The other thing is, is that self-attention mechanism that I talked about earlier and the multi-head attention, which is what ultimately helps resolve all those co-references, grammar rules, and so on. Um, I won't get into much more detail about that here, but if you're interested, again, I highly recommend you read that attention is all you need paper, and there's a lot of other ways to learn more about transformer architectures and the attention mechanisms. I'm also happy to answer questions here at the end. Um, Cool. So let's take a quick look at what, what do we mean by this attention stuff. Why is it important? Why is it needed? So here's an example from Google. I arrived at the bank after crossing the river. What does bank mean? First of all, bank is one of these words that's ambiguous here because it can mean more than one thing. What's one of the things it can mean? Just shout it out. Financial, Financial institution, right? What else could it mean? A riverbank. This is the other side of the river, yeah. Um, first of all, let me ask you another question, just, or second of all. Is there a right answer to this? Is, it, is there definitively a right answer? No, so that, that's part of what makes language hard. But secondly, if we were to try and say that one answer is more probabilistic or correct, which one would we say? Is it a financial? How many of you think financial institution? And how many of you think riverbank? Right, I would say probably more riverbank, probabilistically, like likelihood, right? Um, and the reason is, is because of this word river. So if we pay more attention to that word, if we attend to the word river and use that to help us disambiguate the word bank, then we might be able to say it's more likely that this is referring to the, a riverbank, right? And let's look at another example where this attention concept comes into play and why it's so important. This is what attention is all you need figured out, by the way, and what the, those attention mechanisms in the transformer architecture also help figure out. Now, in this case, let's also see how words can change meaning depending on how they're used and still the importance of that attention mechanism. So in the first example, server, can I have the check? What server is ambiguous until we see the word check the word check, if we attend to it more, pay more attention to that word as helping us disambiguate the word server, server becomes a server at a restaurant or a coffee shop or something like that, or a bar, right? But if we look at the second one, it looks like I just crashed a server. Server's also ambiguous until we look at crashed, and then crashed has us better understand that this is a machine. And it turns out that all the words in the context, or the sentence, all play a role in the meaning of, and in the meaning, in the grammar rule stuff, in the parts of speech, in the context, everything. It's just that some words you should pay more attention to than others, because they have a bigger impact on disambiguating and doing these other things. And you can visualize this stuff, it's really cool. You can go online and check this out. Um, in this case, we're seeing visualization that, like for a sentence right here, you know, it's showing like the different values, what they call attention scores. So those attention mechanisms calculate scores of attention, like how, how much attention should be paid to each of the words in a given sentence. And you can kind of see that there. I highly recommend you check that out more if you're interested. And so here we are today, right? We have these large language models. Obviously, the, the big one everyone's talking about is GPT-4 and, and ChatGPT, but there's other ones. Um, there's GPT-3 and 4. There's, how many of you have heard of BERT? Okay, a bunch of you have heard of BERT. There's BART, there's T5. And these use different parts of the transformer architecture. GPT-3, GPT-4, and ChatGPT only use the decoder side. 
So it's just a decoder. That's what makes it generative because the decoders are a generative thing as part of the transformer architecture. Um, BERT, on the other hand, only uses the encoder side. So it only encodes things. You put something in and it encodes it into some sort of numeric latent representation of that thing that contains all sorts of rich meaning in a latent space of like the meaning, the context, everything. But once you do that, you can use the output of that to do all sorts of really interesting natural language processing type tasks like sentiment analysis, part of speech tagging, theme extraction, and so on and so forth. So they're good for different things. And then when you use these last two, BART and T5, or encoder-decoder models, or sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, they're good for things like machine translation, converting you know, French to English or something like that, because you're converting one sequence of information to another sequence. So it uses both sides of the transformer architecture. And these models are trained on massive data sets. This is the, this is the data set that OpenAI included in their GPT-3 paper. Um, it, I, I've seen different estimates of its size. Some people say it's like 45 terabytes, but then was reduced down or filtered down to like 780 or some, or 870 gigabytes. In either case, this is essentially common crawl and web text are like, think of the entire internet. And then books one and books two are like, just think of a massive, massive number of books that have been digitized, right? And then Wikipedia, all of Wikipedia. So when you think of GPT-3, that, this is what it was trained on. Like the whole internet, tons of books, maybe not all books ever, but tons, and then all of Wikipedia. And that's what gave it, once it learned all those parameters, in the case of GPT-3, again, 175 billion, and some people say that GPT-4 has one trillion parameters. Those parameters represent a model or an understanding of language based on that data set. Now, some people, I recently saw someone say, it might have been Sam Altman, I can't remember, but recently say that these models don't actually understand human language or intelligence. They understand human output, which is super interesting if you think about it, because if it was trained on Wikipedia, the internet, and books, that's not really like how humans just converse every day or talk or whatever using natural language. That's things people put out there as like articles and websites and books and things like that. So that's kind of interesting. So maybe it understands human output really well, but maybe not a lot of other things about uh, human language. One other thing is uh, worth mentioning is this is sort of a diagram published by OpenAI about reinforcement learning from human feedback. Essentially, all it's saying is that to better align the model, like ChatGPT, and make it sound a little more human in its responses, they essentially took had real humans, they put in prompts, and then they had real humans write the, the response to the prompt instead of the machine. And they used that real human responses to fine tune a version of GPT-3 called GPT-3.5 or Turbo or something like that. Then they fine tune GPT, that, mod, that version of GPT-3. Then they used that new fine tuned version to then create like five outputs for one individual prompt and repeat that process and then take those five outputs from the prompts and have humans rank them from one to five based on like what's the best prompt that will be the best, most aligned answer, not prompt, sorry, answer, for what people are intending to get out of that prompt and human values, transparency, trustworthiness, all that stuff. And then they, they use another technique called uh, reinforcement learning to train a reward policy model, which then creates the final version of chat GPT that we see today that should be more human sounding and also more aligned. And so this has raised this whole new field of prompt engineering, which when we think of prompts, when you put a prompt into these models, they can contain more, you know, multiple things. One is they could contain a system message. So you say, hey, you're, you're a professional copywriter that specializes in writing copy that's very friendly, enthusiastic, and helpful. And then you can include context, which is in the case of summarizing an article, the context would be the article. The instructions are stuff like, hey, please summarize this. And then remember we talked about few shot learning. You can also condition these models on the fly using examples. What about tools? How do we use that? I mean, obviously the, the obvious one is chat GPT. So we can use that tool, but this is a software developers conference. And so, you know, there's GitHub Copilot. This is built actually on one of OpenAI's um, models called Codex. Uh, Codex, by the way, GitHub did a, 
did a study, you should check it out online, I highly re recommend, but they did a study where they tried to figure out, okay, how useful are these tools for software developers and engineers, and like what can they do exactly? How can they be used and how useful are they? And the summary they gave, and I'll show here in a minute some other stuff from that, that study. The summary they gave is that basically Copilot results in faster completion times, it helps uh, conserve mental energy, it helps software developers and engineers be more satisfied with the work they do and just have more fun doing that work. Also, there are other ones. Um, so this Copilot, if you didn't know or haven't used it, is also an extension uh, as part of Visual Studio Code. I know a lot of people use that. Um, and then also there's Salesforce CodeGen, Amazon Code Whisperer, Hugging Face that I talked about earlier has um, something called Star Coder, and they also have a collaborative project, I think with ServiceNow called uh, Big Code, and then there's one called Tab9. So there's quite a few tools out there using these kinds of models for software development type stuff. Um, what about pitfalls and concerns, right? Well, number one, these models, as amazing as they are, and they even get some people thinking they're demonstrating human intelligence or whatever, and you know, AGI, some, some people maybe say, um, they really actually have major, major gaps and pitfalls, so we'll just quickly go over some of that. One is common sense. We, we as humans have common sense that these models do not at all have. And some people will refer to that as a world model. A good example is that, of that is that I know, without even thinking about it, that I shouldn't start walking backwards. Why is that? Because I'll walk right off the stage, right? There's a drop there. I know that because I knew I came on the stage. Even though I'm not looking backwards, I know just through my common sense, like, hey, don't walk backwards or don't, don't like keep walking this way. There's a lot more examples of that too. Reasoning, causality. Humans have a really good sense of causality, like which things result in what other things and by how much. Even if we don't think about it that way, we really do, whereas algorithms and machines and things don't. And so a lot of times to figure out causality, you need to do things like experimentation, like A-B testing and multivariate testing and things like that. We also have agency and free will. We could decide not to do things or that we're not in the mood or that we don't know the answer or all these things. Uh, but when you put in a prompt to chat GPT and you hit go, it doesn't decide not to give you the result, right? It just churns the result out and spits it out, and that's it. Um, and then goes back to sitting there idly. We're also very adaptable, flexible, and so on. And so going back to that point, you could think of it almost like a, like a vending machine, these models, right? They're not being trained on the fly. They're not dynamically updating or anything like that, at least with ChatGPT, GPT-4, and a lot of the similar language models like Llama, Claude, and so on. You know, you put in a dollar bill, you click some numbers, you select your chips or your candy bar, it gets it out and then it's done. It just goes back to sitting idle, right? It doesn't choose to give you something different, it doesn't choose not to do it. The programming is already in the machine to take whatever you selected and give you something out. That's a, very much how these large language models work as well. So let's just do a quick example too to help demonstrate a little bit more some of the things that humans can do that machines can't do. So this is an example I gave it when I spoke at South by Southwest last year. Um, so here's an image, and there's obviously someone wiring their plants, and there's a little thought bubble that says, I love my plants, right? A lot of times, the most important information actually isn't explicitly there. It's what you can't see that usually has the most amount of information and the things that we understand pretty naturally without even thinking about it as a human. We're able to deduce things that aren't always there. So the question I have for you real quick is why does she love her plants? She likes taking care of plants, yep. What else? What? Subjective experience. Plants doing well, maybe she likes nurturing things. Anything else? She doesn't need a reason, that's valid, yep. It might smell nice, maybe it creates oxygen in the room, that's very nice, because you kind of breathe it, right? Or it gives a little feng shui to the room, or a little neck, like a little color to the room. Here's another quick question, why did she choose this particular plant? Yeah. 
what were some of the reasons? Oh, memories. Okay, maybe has some memories about plants like this growing up or something. Yeah, likes the hanging look of it. Yeah. And hard to kill, easy to maintain, totally. Like maybe doesn't require that much water or sunlight. And actually, we can look at this picture and say, huh, it looks kind of dark there. I don't see any natural light shining in from like a window. Maybe there's no window nearby. But you see how we could do that, right? That's, that is a, a very difficult thing to mimic with machines. And so next time you, you go put a prompt in the, you know, GPT-4 or chat GPT and it spits out an answer, and it seems like magic and remarkable, just keep in mind, like I said, with the vending machine, it's literally spitting out the most probabilistic answer possible based on how it was trained in the model. But it's, it's not doing what we just did, right? Um, we're seeing things that aren't in the image. From a pitfalls perspective, there, there are many, right? Like these things create what they call hallucinations. They'll, they'll spit out complete nonsense that's totally not factual whatsoever and incorrect. I've done it, like just asked it about myself and like why did I write my book? And I got an answer back and I went to Oxford University for a computer engineering degree, which I did not do. Um, and all these other totally nonsensical things. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, but also, you know, they, there's a lot of, and, and it does so, by the way, very confidently. You know, you, you get the responses from this thing with like extreme confidence, even though it's, it, it can be very false and untrue. Alignment, we already talked about. Safety is the idea of AI for good, not for harm. And so there's these questions around, hey, is this going to be used for misinformation, disinformation, things like that? Fairness, AI that's beneficial to all and not only to some and free of bias and discrimination, very important topics. And then of course, what are the potential impacts of these things on jobs and work? Very important questions and potential pitfalls. But on the other hand, why are they beneficial? And there's really a lot of reasons, right? That we already kind of talked about with the GitHub stuff. You know, it helps us do things that maybe we're not good at. For me, it helps me write copy and marketing type materials, which is not my strong suit. It helps me ideate and brainstorm things. It can help speed things up and so on. Um, so there are also a lot of benefits. And there's a lot of benefits to AI in general, by the way, outside of just this, um, which we won't get into today because we're talking about large language models. But um, so what does this mean, though, for the future work? Because that's a question that many have and for good reasons. And so let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, Back in the day, people used to wash clothes by hand. Um, people also had to do all their farming, either by hand or using animals. So they couldn't cover a lot of ground, they couldn't produce enough food for everybody, or enough food cheap enough to make it cost effective. People, the primary way to get around was horses and buggies, or just horses or walking. Um, if you wanted to get information, you had to go to a library and you had to search far and wide and hope you found the right information that you needed. Um, filmmakers and film editors, you know, for the, for, for the history of film until certain developments, which we'll talk about next, you know, the people, folks had to do a very tedious, long process of like cutting and splicing every little bit of film and take a huge amount of time. It was a huge undertaking to create movies. If you wanted to get money out, or make a deposit, you'd have to physically go to a bank and you'd have to wait in line and do all these things. And if you wanted to write things, either you had to do it by pen and paper, pencil and paper, or through a typewriter, which is very error prone. And if you made a mistake, you have to start over again, things like that. So of course we live in a world now where we have laundry machines and we have tractors that can farm much, much greater pieces of land and create much more food that, in a much more cost-effective way that can be passed on to consumers. We have airports. Think about, by the way, when you think about job automation things, think about how many people work at an airport. Just one airport. It's for, you know, for every few of those horse and buggy driver folks that were out of their job, you know, a lot of times, in fact, through most of history, technology has really usually resulted in a net gain of jobs, not loss. And sometimes huge numbers of jobs. It just depends. Um, we obviously have computers that could do so many things. We have Adobe tools like Adobe Premiere and Photoshop that make uh, you know, film editors and uh, phot photographers' lives a lot easier and better. We have the internet, so we don't have to go to the libraries every time. We can kind of find whatever we need anytime. And we have ATMs. 
in a study done by Deloitte, people were asked, hey, do you believe AI enhances your performance and job satisfaction? And a whopping 82% strongly agreed or agreed. Going back to that GitHub study, this is a, a chart from that study where they basically uh, pulled all these different workers, software developers and software engineers, and they said, hey, um, you know, how do you, what is this, what do these models do for you? Things like Copilot, like we talked about, right? Like, how do you use them? What do they help you with? And they had a list, like, I'm more productive, more satisfying, and so on. And you could see that the number of participants that agreed or strongly agreed in, all, in virtually all cases was pretty significant. And there weren't many that were like, no, it doesn't help me with these things, which is kind of interesting. They also did an experiment in the same study where they had 95 developers, they had a task that involved doing, writing a web server with JavaScript, and they had 45 use Copilot and 50 did not use Copilot. And the ones that used it completed the task in one hour and 11 minutes, as opposed to two hours and 31 minutes, which was 55% quicker. So the question is, okay, what does this mean for jobs? Is this, is this something to be worried about? It may be, we'll see, time will tell. I mean, it, it, as I mentioned earlier, technology has always impacted jobs to some extent. Oftentimes, again, it's creating new jobs. Most of the research today shows that there's likely to be a net gain of jobs for the foreseeable future, not a net loss, it's one. But it can definitely have an impact on some jobs and the tasks that people do every day. And here, The Economist just last week or so, or May 7, came out with this article, your job is probably safe from AI. And New York Times uh, a couple of days ago came out with an article, The Optimist Guide to Artificial Intelligence at Work. One of the other interesting things to think about is as of May 5th, 2023, at least here in the US, our unemployment rate was 3.4%, which was a 54 year low. And there were 253,000 jobs added in April. And this is during a time where the world is the most technologically advanced it's ever been. So it's an interesting, uh, point of reference in terms of real data and, and evidence and facts and things like that. And sometimes now you're hearing people say, well, AI won't take your job, someone using it will. And I think this is very true, although there's some nuance to that in that some jobs will potentially be replaced by AI over time, although for others, some tasks may change significantly. It's a little hard to say, uh, although in history, I think for the most part, there haven't been any concrete examples or maybe one or two where an entire job got replaced and automated. Um, but there's a lot more that we do every day in the work that we do that LLMs can't do today, right? Like just a one LLM can't do everything that everyone does at their job every day. But in some cases, maybe at some point they will. So the key in those cases is to embrace new tools and technologies, uh, learn more about them and try and incorporate them into your work. One other thing, real quick, is this idea of the 10x engineer or developer that comes up a lot. So the question then becomes, okay, if these tools really speed things up, does that mean that all of a sudden everybody's going to be a 10x developer or engineer? We'll see. I, time will tell. And then the question is, does that mean that people will reduce their workforce by some fraction of that? And hopefully not. A lot of people are very optimistic in the sense that there's no shortage of work that needs to be done out there with software. There is, you have, I mean, the number of companies that could use more software and more tools and things is massive. And there still is major gaps uh, and shortages in terms of people that write code and know about code and can build these things. And so the hope is that you just get 10 times more software built, not less uh, software developers or engineers. So ultimately, uh, you know, now is the time to seize the day is a newsies reference, I admit it. I like musicals quite a bit. Um, but, you know, I'm, a, I'm forever an optimist. I look at this not as a cup that's half empty and, and represents any sort of gloom or doom, but rather a cup that's half full-ish uh, that represents optimism and opportunity. I love this quote, um, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so, you know, the key again is to keep learning, be flexible, be adaptable, keep developing new skills. Um, and create your future, also focus on, as I said before, there's major gaps that AI can't do or doesn't have, it doesn't have the common sense, the reasoning, the analytical thinking, the ability to ideate and innovate like humans do or solve complex problems and so on. 
So, you know, really focus on and master what AI can't do as you're doing the things that you're also very good at. I also recommend really like finding ways to continue to be very collaborative with your teammates and camaraderie and things like that and maintain company culture, especially in a world now where we have such distributed system, excuse me, distributed um, teams and things like that. And ultimately, by doing those things, you can avoid falling behind. You can get ahead and stay ahead of the pack. And with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it.